my role at the UFC is I oversee our drug testing, our anti-doping program, uh, one of the most comprehensive, the most comprehensive in professional sport. Uh, a few years back, we looked at the program and said it's unfortunate that the majority of news that comes out in the program is bad news. It's when somebody tests positive. Where if you take a step back and look at the reality of the program, it's overwhelmingly good news. It's fighters like Drykus passing test after test after test, no matter where they are in the world. Um, and so what we did is we uh, instituted a recognition program where when athletes get 50 time, perfect test history, they get their 50 time jacket. And it's really been one of the most successful things we've done in the program. It's probably the most common question that I get uh, since we transitioned the program from USADA to now, it's is the jacket still remaining? And it is. And I don't think a better scenario than what Dreykus has, the biggest fight in his life, uh, fighting for the belt, but part of his story is he's one of the most tested athletes on the planet and he continues to test clean time after time after time again. Um, and so we want to give these guys the opportunity to be recognized for that because it's a unique opportunity. You don't see this in professional sport. So Drykus, my pleasure to present you with your 50 time test jacket. Keep doing your thing, setting a good, clean uh, role model example for not only MMA athletes, but really all athletes in professional sports. So we really appreciate it. Congratulations. Sorry, guys. No um, just What's curious, up, everyone? Just curious your uh, thoughts on getting that jacket. I mean, you've only been in the UFC for a couple of years now, and you've already been tested 50 times, which is kind of remarkable. So I guess, what does it mean for this honor, but also like how much of a nuisance is it being to get tested so much? Yeah, I mean, this is amazing. Uh, you know, getting, getting this jacket, obviously people are going to say what they're going to say. And obviously having a physique like mine, people always go, that guy's definitely on the juice. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of athletes, not just me. There's a lot of athletes that get that. And there's a lot of athletes that I even suspect. You can't, you can't help but do it because some people have these physiques. But where the sport is now, I always tell people, listen, if you are going to do it, you are going to get caught. Because from my experience, it's been absolutely professional from the UFC side in terms of making sure we play on a level playing field. And I take, I take uh, comfort in the fact that I get tested. Yeah, it is a bitch sometimes, you know, rocking up to training because they have my time schedule every day. And if they don't know where you are, sometimes you just go, I don't, I'm not in this area today. Something happened, I have an interview. They rock up there and they're like, cool, well, you have two hours to get you. Or they get you, it's, it's but take, I take comfort in the fact that I know my competition is uh, being treated the same way and no, we play fair. We we get in there, and the best warrior wins, not the one with the the best needle. There's been a, a lot of photos of Sean coming out through this camp. People saying, you know, he's in the best shape of his life, all that kind of stuff. Have you seen some of that? And um, are you, I guess, impressed by his physique, maybe compared to some other fights? Um, yeah, I've seen some of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, are we going to stand next to each other and compare physiques? I don't think so. I know you've been asked at nausea about you know all the comments made at the press conference and the fight and everything like that. Uh, and when we spoke you know, last week, you kind of said, I'm too smart to go down that road. I have other things I can do to poke and prod at Sean. But he was very explicit, I think, earlier this week in interviews saying that you know he's going to stab you if you bring that up. He's going to have a knife. Did you see those comments? And I guess, what did you make of that? <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I'm... I don't know, guys. That's that's pretty intense, right? I think that is. Uh, I don't know the legislation around here, but that seems like, you know, team uh, team Sugar needs to step in and check their boy. <laughs> but hey, I think he. I think when we when this whole thing occurred, where he said, "Listen, if you did that again," he said he'll kill me. He didn't say stab me. When he said kill, I said, "Okay, you're probably gonna shoot me then." But when I saw a knife, I'm like, "No, that's not gonna work. You won't touch me with that knife. I'll knock you out way before you get to stab me." 
do you, does any part of you in the back of your mind when you engage with them this week, like keep those comments in mind or are you just going to be yourself and say whatever you need to say? No, 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 no. Um, you know, am I scared that he self-sabotages this fight? Sure. That is something I've thought about. And you know, maybe, you know, trying everything to get out of it. But no, no, no. For me right now, the last press conference was winning on the mic. That was winning the... Sean Strickland at his own game. Right now, this week where we're at, I'm not here to do that. I'm here to be the middleweight champion of the world. My focus is on fighting and, and uh, you know, not making jokes, getting the crowds to laugh. And, you know, no, that's not why I'm here. I'm here. I've already won that battle. That battle is won. Right now, the battle needs to be won is the one coming Saturday night. And that's where my mind's at. My mind is at, being ready mentally, physically, and being in the best shape of my life come Saturday night. And just last thing for me, I'm um, speaking of, you know, kind of the win pre-fight, his coach even said that he was triggered and he had to have a conversation with Sean about not fighting emotionally, saying that's not who we are and stuff. Uh, once the fight begins, though, I mean, what are you expecting from him? Do you think that's going to get lost and an emotional side of him will come out? Yeah, I think uh, it takes a lot for, for a team to admit something like this. You have to take that and... If it was a real problem, I don't think they would have. But I do think he has the right people around him. They are an extremely good team. They, I mean, they've showed that over the, the last year. They've had an incredible year with, uh, uh, with the coach and, and the team and, you know, with all the awards and deservingly so. Um, but I think he has the right people around him to, to, get him to, uh, to get him back to where he needs to be. Because we saw that... Uh, he was definitely not in a good space of mind during that presser at the end. He was genuinely triggered and obviously at the event where he jumped over chairs. And anybody who thinks that was fake or staged, I wasn't informed of that because I took some real punches. <laughs> but, you know, for me, that was, a, that, was a, that was a big, big win. But I do think he has the right people and I hope for him, his sake he has the right people around him to get him back to where he needs to be because if you're going to fight that way, it's um, it's going to disappointing for be disappointing for a lot of people. Drikas, Drikas uh, Neil Davidson from the Canadian Press. The Springboks put out a message on social media today, wishing you well. I, I'm sure you saw that, but do you have a sense of uh, the support back in South Africa? Are you seeing that from here? Oh, absolutely. It's it's you wouldn't believe in South Africa what the vibe is like. I'm speaking to uh, to folks uh, back home all the time. My family is flying in from South Africa. They are arriving this afternoon. It's electrifying South Africa. There's watch parties everywhere. There's, uh, I mean, there's even watch parties for previous fights happening right now as the build-up leads. Uh, we are proud people, and like you said, you know, world champions recognizing world champions. The Springboks uh, made history by being the first country ever to have back-to-back -back rugby World Cups. They have the most World Cup wins in the history of the sport. I'm honored, you know, as a, the Springboks are superheroes. And uh, for them to, to show their support and love towards me, it's, you know, it, it, the motivation I get from that, it's a, it's a dream come true. And you know, that is, that we have that Bok fire. That's what we call it, the Bok fire. And uh, it'll show on Saturday night. And just a follow-up for me, if I may. You said that at uh, the press conference you won on the mic. But uh, do you regret making comments about somebody's abusive background? Is that something that you think, should be discussed well he discussed it so you know if you're gonna if you're gonna go out there and say hey kids you need to be abused more hey kids uh, you need drunken rage abused beatings by your parents like i got when i grew up then i mean that's you putting it out there that's you joking about it i wasn't joking about it i am gonna beat the shit out of sean strickland that wasn't a joke so he made those comments he made it public and he was making a joke of it, not me. Do I think it's, it's good? No, it's terrible what happened to him. It's terrible what happened to him, but now he felt. I was completely respectful towards Sean Strickland, that whole press conference, and you can go watch it back and you'll see. Even when he threw a, a couple of jabs, I just let it slide, let it slide. And then when he tried to get the crowd up and going, the only way he knows how to by saying, uh, offensive stuff and being um, outrageous and you know just screaming over everybody and he he tried to bully me and I wasn't going to let that slide and that's what he did that's what he 
when he saw he couldn't get the crowd behind him like he usually does in terms of, you know, being funny because we were respectful towards each other, he tried to be disrespectful. And I showed him what it feels like if you get some of your own medicine. So I was 100%, I do respect him a lot, but I'm not going to let you bully me. Not at all. Just 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 go, you're going back to the to those comments, right? You said I, you know, I said them to win, like to stop him winning the crowd and stuff. Is there a part of you that thinks this is a mental game as well? It clearly bothers him so much. I may as well say it this week because it might affect him going into the fight. Yeah, but saying it again, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, that's a one-trick pony. Saying it again, it makes no sense. You know, obviously, uh, I said it. If I had the opportunity to, uh, if we to turn back time, I would do it exactly the same. But there's no need to say it again. There's no need to. Listen, and another thing, we'll see how he behaves himself. Like I said, you're not going to bully me. I'm here to be respectful. I'm, I'm a martial artist, but you're not going to bully me. So behave yourself and you know, we, can have a, we can have a civil banter back and forth. I'm 100% all for that, but you're not going to be bullying me. Not at all. You mentioned he might self-sabotage this fight. Are you concerned that he's basically going to feel the pressure after those remarks and that he might feel like he's going to lose this and he can't go out there and lose face? Is that why you think he might self-sabotage? Yeah, I don't know what it might be. I think um, you know, for a guy with, with the kind of demons that Sean Strickland's fighting, uh, one can only think, and I'm not in this situation, so I can't say, but it, uh, you know, self-sabotage and in a sense where he does not care what happens to him because um, he wants to do what he feels is necessary because that will make him a real man. No, the, what makes you a real man is, is being an example. And yeah, I mean, like I always say, you know, being a champion, being in the limelight, you should be yourself. I'm being myself, and I'm not always the best example. Make no mistake, especially with now with all the cameras are on, uh, everywhere you go, it's a, it's, it's great, it's cool. But you know, the more uh, I look at a guy like Connor, he gets seen doing so many wrong things. But it's just because everything he does is filmed. I feel sorry for the guy because most of us do a lot of things that are not wrong, went wrong, especially when you're out partying. You're not really considering being an example to kids when you're out partying. You're in a place. That's why there's an age restriction. And then you get filmed and it gets put all over the internet and people judge you for it. I mean, people are going to say what they're going to say. And I mean, just live your life. Don't care about it. You know, and whenever you can, try and be a good person wherever you can. But I mean, if, if you make mistakes, we move on from them. So, you know, with this, with this whole thing with him self-sabotaging, I think... Um, yeah, I think it might be that to to prove a point. And the fight the, is the only thing that's important to me. So what I'm saying with South Sabotage is, um, I also like fast cars. I like uh, adrenaline. I'm a I'm a I'm a crazy person. I'm an adrenaline junkie. But when my fight camp starts, there's a priority. There's things that needs to happen for me to do my job. And it feels like uh, that one aspect of him doesn't care. And then of course, you know the fight that happened in the crowd, that was the biggest concern for me of that whole situation is the fact that the fight could be in jeopardy and I'm really happy it wasn't. Yeah, going back to that brawl, you know, obviously it's like a little skirmish, 30 seconds maybe, but is there anything you could take away from that physical interaction with him? Yeah, the man's not scared to throw down, firstly, and uh, yeah, he could feel the strength. Now he knows, now he knows. He had those scrawny hips. <laughs> Last one for me. Uh, Israel Adesanya is picking you to win this fight. He thinks you're going to get the finish. Does that surprise you considering his attitude towards you in the past? Um, no. The man has a knowledge for fight. So that makes sense. But yeah, I, I don't really consider that a, a good thing or a bad thing. I, I'm, I'm happy to get uh, when somebody thinks I'm going to win because even though we have our differences as people and as uh, one man to another, as a fighter, as, as fighters, like, I can only say good things about Adesanya as a fighter. You know, he's had some terrible fights where he just, you know, won the fight running and all that, but he's had some amazing fights, some of the best fights we've seen. And he, he has had some of the best striking performances that the UFC has ever seen. But that is not, so that is a martial artist uh, recognizing another. And in that case, I'm, I'm, yeah, it, it's it's great to to see uh, somebody like that uh, know that you uh, you have what it takes. Drink us right here. Just to follow up to you, right? Um, Sean said he reached out to you and you had agreed to lay off the 
the abuse comments. Um, is, is that accurate? Can you give your side of it? I believe it was your DMs maybe. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, this happened the day after the altercation in the crowd. And uh, I'm talking about I arrived in South Africa as we were on the runway still taxiing to, uh, to where we get off. Uh, I opened my, my phone and I, get, uh, I saw a DM from, from Sean Strickland. And I thought it was maybe like a fan page, going to be hate mail or something like that. But, and I said, no, it's actually Sean Strickland's page. I do follow him. And <laughs> it said, um, hey, um, so something along the lines of, listen, uh, this is what happened. I'm sorry what I said about your coach and uh, you, but if there's anything that's crossing the line for you, just, uh, and he's like, listen, I know there's, we sell a fight and all that, but if there's anything out of line, that I said that you want me to pull back, like I'm, I'll, I'll apologize. I'll even take back what I said. I'll remove post. And uh, I mean, I feel kind of like this is not a great move to, um, but he brought it up. I would have never told the media about this. Otherwise, this happened five weeks ago. I would have told, talked about it. You know, I don't want to expose a man uh, in that way. It wasn't, it's not my style. I was actually surprised that I saw him make it public that he did message me because I didn't want to, uh, I'll him on that, but since we're talking about it, and he, uh, yeah, so he said, if there's anything that he's not, he shouldn't say, like he'll lay back, but if I bring up the thing with his, uh, of his childhood again, he said, I'll kill you and ruin your life and mine way before we step into the cage, something like that. That's exactly his words. So I'm like, okay. So this, this poor guy, this seems pretty serious. I feel, I feel bad for him. But I just replied and said, listen, there's nothing you can say that has any effect on me. Like, go crazy. You're talking about me kissing other dudes. I have more photos. I post the, them online. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> you think I care? I'm completely comfortable with my sexuality. Have you seen my girl? My guy. Yeah. So I don't care about that. You know, me kissing my coach, kissing my dad, kissing my brothers. I don't feel like people saying, oh, that's gay. So what? I don't care. I love those people. That's my family. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really, there's nothing you can say that can get under my skin. This is shield. I'm the mentally strongest fighter in the world. And I told him, you can say literally whatever you want. All is fair in love and war. But I won't say anything about your child again. Uh, Cool, you know, and that's that's a, yeah, that that's how it came down to. And if uh, sorry, one more, um, if there wasn't a title on the line, if this was just another fight, do you think the the trash talk would have gone to this place? Um, if if it went down the way, if he said what he said, yeah, 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 exactly the same. Like if you go look at that press conference, I approached it like every other one, having respect for my opponent. It was it's your it's my opponent's uh, decision how I'm going to react in terms of if you want to keep this civil and respectful or not. And I came in there with a mindset of being respectful, but like I said, I won't be pushed around. So whether it's a title fight or not, I approach all of them exactly the same. For me, this fight, the Whitaker fight, my debut against Marcus Perez, exactly the same up here. James. How's it going? Good to see you. Um, I know you talked a bit about like what's next for the winner of this fight. You talked a bit about Hamzat Chimaya. I was curious where you think Jared Cannonier fits in the title picture, just with him having a win over Sean Strickland already. Like, how do you rate him in the division? Yeah, I've, that's such a hard question. I think he's sometimes overlooked. Um, Jared Cannonier. I actually met him at 296 as well. Uh, super nice guy. And uh, yeah, everybody was looking forward to the division shake like being shaken up because I mean if you look at a year ago it was Izzy and and Rob up there and the rest of the division almost down here and and we we caught up quickly and look at the whole division everything looks different now but uh right now there's so many options because we didn't have options that was the problem and that's why I was so surprised that the UFC picked me to fight Rob because you're sitting with what the UFC did look at all the contenders they first fought for the belt. They would fight up into the top five, three. 
fight Adesanya, lose that fight, then they get Robert Whittaker. Because the UFC knew if you give any of these containers to Robert Whittaker, we don't have another container. We're just going to have Rob and Easy the whole time. And that's how they planned it out. You could see it. It was Easy, then Whittaker. Vitori. All of these guys, that's how the, uh, even um, Kennedy himself fought the champ, fought Whittaker. With me, I'm like, yeah, they want me to be a contender. And all of a sudden, they phone me and they go, you get Rob. I go, okay. So this is sink or swim. For them, that's what this was. They're like, we need Rob out of here. Like, we love Rob, but at the end, they're like, we can't do Rob and Easy every time. And we have this crazy South African guy who's super strong and weirdly knocks everybody out. Um, let's give him to Rob and see what happens. And that was a big test for me. That was for them. They went, if he loses, uh, if he wins, we have something on our hands. And uh, I went out there and I did my job. I went out there and did my job. And the same with Cannonier right now. There's, now there's so many people and so many contenders that it's almost hard because you have to make the right decision at the right time. Because a fight that's going to be hyped up and sell, sell, sold and selling like crazy right now is not necessarily the one that's going to be have that kind of hype six months from now. What was it like training with MMA Guru? Uh, I didn't train with him. He was just there. He, he, I know he did some pad work because I was in the middle of my camp. He did some pad work with uh, Cameron Simon. Uh, they did a boxing session. But man, I don't know if you guys saw that photo of me and him, and people thought it was Photoshop. It wasn't. It, it was, obviously, the angle was upwards, but I, I thought he was like a short, fat guy, to be honest. I thought, like, he was going to be a little bit overweight and short. When I saw him, he was in great shape. Like, he was in good shape, and he was super tall. So that was really cool, and, yeah, I mean, it was, it was great to meet him. You know, uh, seeing MMA enthusiasts, uh, like that meeting guys really start i mean all of you guys as journalists had to start somewhere i mean a lot of uh, especially in mma there was only one reason to get into this and that was the passion for the sport if i'm i can be wrong but that's how i as a fighter and most journalists who, who cover mma i believe got into it is the passion you have for it and he's one of those guys so um yeah it was great to have him there um i, uh, I took him uh, with the team with the team we had a fight with mark Hume uh, at a local event there where i came up and he joined us there. He, uh, we got him tickets to go to the show, and he watched us train. So, yeah, I think he had a great time in South Africa. So last one for me, not looking past Saturday, but if you go out there and you come out pretty much unscathed, uh, is UFC 300 a possibility for you? Would you want to get on that card? Listen, if there's one thing I can tell you <laughs> that I've learned from this industry is don't say anything about after a fight, after a fight, because they will crucify you whether you're injured or not. But let me tell you this, that would be ideal. That would be an ideal situation. I would love to fight UFC 300. As a champion, it doesn't get much, much bigger than that. Except if we take it to South Africa. Hi, uh, Keith Whittier with Auto Life Magazine. Hi, Keith. I would love to ask, what would becoming the champion mean to you? Because one of the things that I really appreciate is that your singular focus seems to be on Saturday, with the exception of the, the UFC 300 question. I haven't really heard you talk about anything beyond this Saturday, and I know that's your singular focus. So what would becoming champion mean to you? Yeah, becoming champion uh, is a culmination of, of, of 15 years of my life. The amount of times that I couldn't attend family matters, the amount of times that I couldn't attend uh, weddings, just to get on top of my great parties, that's never going to happen again. Like once in a lifetime parties, I'm telling you, that I couldn't go to. And um, just the sacrifices that made and, you know, having my whole family and friends, the close circle has been there since I started this at the age of 15. Uh, my my dream to become a UFC champion. All the sacrifices they made, all the people that's coming from South Africa, friends, I'm talking about 100 plus people, close friends, people I know that's coming to Canada. It's an expensive trip. It's a long trip coming just to watch me perform and become world champion. Having guys like the Springbok team, they are titans in the world of sports. They are probably the most successful sporting unit on earth. Reach out and, and showing support. That feeling of having a whole nation waiting for you to be and wanting you, truly wanting in their hearts, want you to be successful, 
that feeling is undescribable. It's so much bigger than my own personal goals because this started out as a personal goal and it became a goal for South Africa, for my country, for all the people around me that I promised I'm going to do this, to make it worthwhile for them. And the wind is bowed for me on a personal note, for my family tree, for my brother's kids, for my kids, for my dad that gave me everything, um, to, to every duplicy that's going to come. This will be in the history books, and this is massive. And I've always imagined it to be like that, to be, to have that legacy, to have the biggest legacy um, that my family tree has ever seen and make myself, my family, my country, and my people proud. It would mean absolutely everything. There's nothing in the world that would mean more to me than win that belt. While you've been here, I've noticed that you've been hanging out with the guys at Primal MMA. What kind of a difference does it make when you're far from home, when you're embraced by a local scene here? Yeah, that's 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 uh, that's very true. I couldn't believe. Uh, I know Canada gets a lot of shit from the world media. <laughs> well, not media. Like, I mean, if you watch TV, South Park, for example. I mean, <laughs> they don't. They're not too fond of the Canadians I've seen. And when I got here, I've never been to Canada. Never been to Canada. And I get here and I love it. I I go. Here we go. When we get here, I go, cool. First interaction with a Canadian person in Canada. Let's see. And I go, okay, that guy was exceptionally nice. Because I know that's the kind of shit they get for being too nice. And then everybody's being nice to me and nice to me. And then we get into an Uber and we drive, uh, I don't know, I'm not 100% sure, but maybe 30 minutes from here to find a gym. And the Uber driver takes us there. I think it's a $40 trip. We get there. The gym is closed. As I can see, and there's like a snow blizzard starting, and we get out of the Uber, and I'm not accustomed to snow. I, I'm like, how long does it take to I like, get frostbite? Am I gonna die now? I have a fight. I need. I can't get frostbite right now. And I jump back in the car, and the trip's over. Like we walked around the building, me and Mark, my teammate, and I get. I jump back in the Uber, and the Uber is almost gets a fright because he's looking at his next trip, and I'm like, sorry, man, I can't be out there. It's it's, it's there's a blizzard, and he says, okay. No problem. I said, can I like extend my trip? And he says, it's not possible. And we go, I said, no, okay, let's just see if there's a gym around. We don't find anything. He says, do you guys want a coffee? I said, yeah, sure. Drive to a coffee. We're on the clock, so perfect. We get there. This guy gets us coffee. I give him uh, money and to get himself one too. And he says, no. And he swipes his card. And it was like $10 for the coffee for the three of us uh, at a Timmy's. And he gets the coffee. And I'm like, wow. Cool, maybe put it on my tab. So he got, this guy says, no, we didn't use the Uber app for this. And that was $40. So give, just give me $20 for the trip back. The exact same trip. And he bought $10 worth of coffee. And I gave this guy $40 because I thought, that's not right. Like, guy, come on. And so, I mean, that is just a testimony of how nice the people really was. And then we get to that gym. And everybody was just super nice. And it felt like that old school feeling, you know, this basement gym. Uh, no, it's amazing, and the people have been very accommodating. Um, you can you can call me a fan of Canada, one hundred percent. How about that dip in the lake? That was not so cool. That was that was I have to say that was not so cool. Uh, I'm glad I did it. Now I hated it just that I got out. I mean, when I heard what the degrees of water is, I didn't care because I do it at home every day, two three degrees. But when uh, I got out and it was minus ten eleven with that wind. And it was a five-minute walk for us back to the, to the uh, car. And my hair, just, uh, 15 seconds, hair frozen solid. I've never seen that in my life. Once again, this is where I think, okay, this is a big, big problem. I couldn't use my hands. It felt terrible. But, I mean, things we would do for the camera, right? <laughs> Thank you, everybody.